If I asked you to get a piece of paper and something to write with and to make a numerical list of all the things that you would be willing to die for, how long is your list? The part of what age? Willing to die for. The part of what age? Willing to die for. How long is your list? What is the tribal thing? The part of what age? The tribal self is the goal above the immediate acquaintances of the social Willing to die for. The family, the people you know, the next door, you but the people you know. The tribal self. The part of age? I'm talking about gold, baby. Gold. Yes, I'm gold. Sir, it's always a it's always a pleasure to be building in the building with the builders, the Panther Forty Eight. Because every time I, I I turn to the show, I hear y'all uh, building on something that's relevant, not just doing commentary but substantive stuff. So, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation. So, the origin of this conversation is centers around something that's called what we call LBC, and that's not Long Beach, California. That's livable black cities. Okay, so, and the things that must be present in order for us to have these livable black cities, certain ingredients, certain uh, maintenance aspects, certain, certain concepts that we must all share in order to uh, partake in the livable black cities. But at the same time, we know uh, we've had these livable black cities such as Selma, such as Rosewood, such as other black cities that were uh, interfered with uh, burnt down and sabotaged, you know, purposefully. So, and we still have many of these centers in what they're what I call the 16 black meccas. And when we say mecca, we, we mean metropolitan economic center of culture uh, and commerce for Afro-Asiatic descendants, you know, it's an acronym. Okay. Um, but they're not as well connected as as they should be and could be. There's other people who's benef who benefit economically off these 16 black meccas more than us, even though they're centered around our commerce, our culture, our collectivism. Other people are benefiting off these. You know, when I say that, I mean, of course, you know, the white supremacists and all the white supremacists lackeys whom set up stores and markets all around these 16 black meccas. So, you know, you, you, you have to say at some point, well, what is it that holds this big black giant back from taking power in their own land, in the cities which they founded, in the cultural centers which they have economic hegemony in? What are these things, you know? And this is where I go into what I call the 11 principles of white supremacy. Uh, the first one being denial. And when I say denial, it's like, if you notice everything in which we want and which we need to be self-sustaining, there's an aspect, even though everyone knows we're justified having this because we're the builders of this country, you know, the designers of this country on many levels. As far as the modern conveniences, we created all the modern conveniences. However, there's a continual denial to give us what? Human rights and just the basic fundamentals of existence. Constant, constant. And this is it's not written into law, but it's written into common law. You see, even when your kids go to school, you pay just as much tax as their white as your white counterparts. Somehow our kids get a lesser education and get denied human rights and to be treated like a human, even though we're paying sometimes even more taxes, you know? That's that denial. Then the denial is also He's going to deny anything you identify that he's done to you and you pointed out that's racist, that's inhumane, that uh, points him out, you know, in a negative light. He's going to deny all of that. So one thing, the problem with denial or the, the issue with denial was that you can't be waiting on him to confirm what you know is true. When I say white supremacy, got to preface this before I go into the rest of these. Um, I. Uh, uh, define that as normalized insanity, you see? So meaning that, and, and that the symptoms of this insanity are the 11 principles that are mentioned above. So if you go along and participate in these 11 principles, consciously or unconsciously, 
it leads you to uh, uh, insanity and further into insanity. Okay, let's keep going. One that we all see that's plaguing America, that's whooping America's behind, you know, but has whipped our people for a long time. And they even use drugs on the uh, on, on the uh, plantation to get us to long to get us to work long hard hours, opium, etc., cocaine and whatnot. But the second one is chemical warfare, you know. And we've seen this used against the Chinese around the um, early 1900s, and this was a way that they had pretty much subjugated a large part of China, and were able to control the commerce and were able to control the people of China using opium. And it took them years to shake loose from that at, at, at the time they were in right now. In the time that we came out of the 80s and the 90s, we know South America was locked where they couldn't really grow food because they were being forced to grow cocaina, you know, because that's a cash crop, you know, and it was also being used upon the, the, the to, to control the citizens. And to this day, we're looking at a lot of people coming in from another country, okay, Mexico, bringing a drug that's being brought from China into Mexico and then into America as a form of chemical warfare against foundational black Americans and just against, you know, Americans in general, but we're talking about us, you know, and we see once upon a, fentanyl kind of came out of nowhere, man, punched us right in the face and now we're dealing with it, but we don't really have no preface for it. But what we can say, we know it's a part of the continued chemical warfare that's been going on against our community. You know, um, at the time of the BLA, it was stuff like cocaine, it was stuff like heroin. Now we're dealing directly with these um, other designer drugs, you know, that the pharmaceutical companies uh, put out that find their way onto the streets and in the hands of our young people. And this is almost like a part of the culture now, you know, to be on Adderall's, to be on Percocet, they rapping about it and everything, you know? Once again, this is this is chemical warfare, you know? When somebody, they necessarily can't get at you the way they want to. They've tried to get at you physically, but they didn't have the results they wanted to, so they had to resort to something else. Chemical warfare. The next one being displacement. Oh, real, real quick, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Come on. I want us to bag up just a minute and, 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 and talk about something. And, and I, I would like us, if, if, uh, if anybody wants to jump in, for us to kind of just give our thoughts on each yeah. one of these. Come so on. to me, before we start on any of these, I would like to give my definition of what, what, what I refer to as white supremacy. Come on. The systematic belief, expression, and practice that white people must be the primary holders of power, authority, and rights in order to maintain global social, political, and economic order ordained to them as God's chosen people. So to me, when you look at white supremacy from that definition, and we talk about the first thing you brought up, which was denial. From my reality, if I am a white supremacist, I there is no denial that I am God's chosen people. Therefore, everything that is based on implementing implementation of power, thought, any of that, is going to be going is going to be through the lenses that I provide. So when you talk about the deny or the denial of something, or, or, or let's even just see the essence of what the truth is, mm -hmm. my reality is based upon me feeling like I'm God's chosen people. And by being God's chosen people, that means that I, regardless of the dynamics of, 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 of the reality in terms of the, the, the population of the world, that even if I make up a small percentage of the world's population, I am supposed to be the ordained controller of, of power, authority, and rights. Indeed. So at that standpoint, my denial of you having the equal access or the right access to your own your own resources, your own your own philosophy, your own knowledge, your own tools, your own land is by is is by is by my right. Is is by right. And so I just wanted to drop right. that in because right. for me, you got you got to start on the, the the premise of 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 the thinking vessel for mm -hmm. some position of white supremacy because mm -hmm. there's a mindset behind why i think the way i think and if i consider myself to be god's chosen people and with mm -hmm. that power i am supposed to be the controller of all of the world's power mm -hmm. then to me everything that's going to come behind that 
is based on that premise. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's a fact. Since we, did you say that you wanted us all to define what we think white supremacy is, or we could just go with that one definition? Because I have. No, no, come on. Let's, 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 let's start a pot, family. Of course, I'm with it. Right. Well, from, yeah. my, from my understanding, this my this my understanding of white supremacy, and it comes from a few a few of our different builders, a few of our <laughs> different builders and teachers. I think that uh, the, the definition Ward just gave was, was spot on point, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a perfect scientific break, uh, understanding of what white supremacy is. Now mm -hmm. let's kind of get into a historical understanding of what white supremacy is. I once heard a teacher say that white supremacy is racism and racism is white supremacy, that there is no way to actually separate the two. When, when, mm -hmm. when you want to call a black person a racist, the best mm -hmm. the, the best thing that you, because you can't actually call a black person a racist because no black person is actually uh, uh, exploiting or, or exercising white supremacy because mm -hmm. racism is, is, is prejudice plus power. And then they chunked the, the whole concept of white supremacy there for the purpose of defining that power, which is white power. So that's why white supremacy becomes the core and the root of racism itself, which is prejudice plus power. It means that I have a prejudice, a prejudice against a particular people because of their culture, uh, uh, their, the color of their skin, their ways, their folk ways, their more ways, their religion, whatever mm -hmm. it is that makes that particular people unique. I have something against that people and I have the power to oppress that group of people politically educationally, economically, socially, on every sphere in, in mm -hmm. a society. And black people don't have that power, so black people can't be racist. At best, a black person can be a bigot, possibly. Right. And the crazy thing about racism, here's the crazy thing about racism. I once heard Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad say that all white people were racist. He said that, uh, if I remember this correctly, he said the only difference is, he said that, that some white people are racist and and are, are more racist than other white people essentially i can't remember the quote verbatim mm -hmm. but he said he said all white people are racist and, and some white people are racist than the rest of the white people he said mm -hmm. what he said and and i would even say that the majority of black people are racist and when i say that what that means is i'm not saying against white people i mean against self because if you're raised, educated, and taught, and grow up in America, you cannot help but to be touched by racism. It's impossible. Many yeah. of the beliefs and ideas that we have, even in the way that we view religion, many of the, the beliefs we have are completely controlled by racism. Right. We believe yeah. we believe a white person is more intelligent than a black person. If I try to bring some issues to a black person and, and show them the book I got it from, oh, that, that was wrote by a nigga. They, uh, who, let me get a real yeah. doctor, a real mm -hmm. scholar, and they call mm -hmm. him the real scholar, the white person. If white I talk, right. if I learn how to talk and utilize the language that I'm that I'm using correctly, I'm told You're that talking I'm talking white. white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I'm told that I'm talking white. So I right. believe that 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 most black people are racist, and I'm not going to go into deeper detail because I feel mm -hmm. like we'll get there later. But that's simply mm -hmm. my understanding of white white supremacy white supremacy is racism and racism is white supremacy and maybe later i because I, I, I like to kind of go into why because i don't think now i disagree with you on that war i don't think that they believe that those guys chose the people i don't think they believe that matter of fact i don't believe that the people who who created and orchestrated white supremacy even believed in god matter of fact the greatest the greatest uh 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 aspect of god that they had ever seen was the black man and the first time they'd even even heard of the concept of god was their contact with with people of african descent african people that's the first time they even heard of god so i don't think it's because of their, their belief that they're god's chosen people i think it's another reason for it and maybe when we get into the dialogue later i'll come back to that and kind of talk about and kind of give what i call my historical definition of what white supremacy is but that's, mm -hmm. that's basically all I have to say for now. And you know, basically, you know, basically I was, my, my, my definition was based upon a psycho, a, a, a psychological analysis saying that it's normalized insanity. Cause there's a lot of things about white supremacy that don't even benefit other white people, but they still go along with it. Okay. Planned Parenthood is almost wiped them out. 
but because they're trying to use it as a weapon against us, they've justified, you know, this evil, right? Okay, they bleach rice, take all the nutrients out of it. For everybody, even white people eat white rice without no nutrients in. They they bleach the the uh the sugar, take all the nutrients out of it. So being that he's the weakest strand of man, anything that you weaken, it's going to hurt him first. Because this is the man with the least amount of minerals, but he's still doing it to hurt us, but ends up hurting himself. So this is why I say white supremacy is normalized insanity. You know, a lot of them, they tried to knock us off with this, uh, with this, uh, with, you know, with the jab. But they end up knocking a whole bunch of them off with the jab, you see? So they kind of going along with their own extinction under the guise of trying to knock us off. That's why I say it's normalized insanity. And, you know, whoever else want to uh, jump in there could go ahead and jump in there. I know Brother everybody, E got something. Everybody yeah, good? He like nobody saying. Go ahead, bro. Now the first point that you said, the first principle that you said was uh, what was it? Denial. Denial. Uh, denial. Yeah, which is a river that runs through Africa, but it also runs through America too. You see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the way through America. <laughs> All right, brother. You can continue. I don't think any of the other brothers have anything to say on the. Uh, okay, on the and then uh, so far. Yeah, and then the second one that I went over was chemical warfare. And we can look at the uh, the crack epidemic, you know, how, you know, crack was actually funneled into our communities by way of the government, you know, as a way for them to fund another government, but also as a way to them, uh, also as a way for them to use chemical warfare upon us. And we've always had drugs in the black community, but this became like a punch, like a knockout punch, you know, and they called it crack. And it came from the cracker and it cracked our communities to the point where we still haven't really put the pieces back together to this day. And this is chemical warfare. So then the next one I'm, I'm gonna go to is, now this is a word, this this is kind of one of them, you know, $100,000 words, but we gonna get to it. But it's a anatomiza anatomization, okay? Meaning that when you demonize somebody or you character assassinate somebody, and we could we could go into this. We see things like uh, uh, the birth of a nation, where uh, they had a characterization. Actually, these were white men in blackface who were saying that black men were rapists, and we were robbing the South and plundering through the South and raping white women and just being terrorists to the to the white community in the early 1900s. This was shown at the White House. This was the most popular movie, made the most money out of all movies of all times. The birth of a nation. But what this was to do was to plant fear in the hearts of whites and possibly Negroes as well. You know, as far as black leadership, black senators, black politicians, black people in positions of authority and whatnot, and black people having civic structures. And this is why after that, a lot of uh, cities got burnt down by the Klan, by the Knights of the White Camellia using this anathemization of the black male image. Cause you know, they didn't have no women in there doing stuff. This was they were portraying a black man, you know, going after the white woman. And to this day, we can look at stuff like um, what happened to uh, Bill Cosby. This is America's number one father, number one husband. But these women came out of nowhere with these lies that they could not confirm. And this man who's like all of our grandfather ended up having to do, man, what, four, five years in federal prison. And it's, hmm, it's not so much the laws, but it's the laws and the media when you put the two together, right? You know, we can go to somebody like Jack Johnson, okay? Jack Johnson, they came up with the Man Act. Okay, the Man Act says if you take women across certain lines and they consider it to be for, you know, not savory purposes, especially if you're a black man, it's a white woman, they could charge you with pimping. And they created this for Jack Johnson, you know? for Jack Johnson, because Jack Johnson was beating the crap out of white men and had a sea of white women cheering for him in the audience that he was going home with after the fight. You know, so when they saw things like this, they said, we have to find a way to character assassinate the black man to drive all women, all people all around the world against this man, because these people making some moves. Okay, so that's Anathemization. We can also look at color purple, stuff like what's love got to do with it, these type of movies, you know? So the next one I like to really go to, and this is one that we're also looking at with the border situation 
and with our communities being destabilized in this uh, displacement. Now, displacement is a very tricky one, y'all, because it deals with gentrification, right? Meaning that someone's coming to take your neighborhood, right? For different reasons and whatnot, to mainly just to destabilize you to where you don't have a base, okay? But at the same time, he's then displaced somebody else from some from somewhere else, and they're bringing them in to assume your position where you were once at. Now somebody else is going to be. So it's like they create fights with groups of people, even in different parts of Africa. They did this so many times, and this was why there was so much tribal warfare because one place where one uh, particular tribal group was at for thousands of years, they brought in this other group you know, on slave ships and why not to displace them, sometimes enslave that group. You know what I mean? So the displacement is a real cold game. And when you throw gentrification in there with it on us and redlining, you know, I mean, most of us, we're not in the places where our parents are really from. We're somewhere else. We had to move because the jobs dried up, um, the property value got too high gang banging drugs moved in or all of the above you know but that's the displacement game and what 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 it does it makes it to where you can never really settle and um, um, um gain uh what they call generational wealth and gain a hold to the land you know okay i'm gonna keep going so then the next one we deal dealing hold on, with hold on, hold on, hold on. come on i want to jump in out real quick come on come on because and i'm not gonna say much but to me that one kind of falls right back on Yep. The root element here. So when I think of displacement, I think of the relocation of control of power yeah. for the resources and thinking. Mm -hmm. Because we have to we have to not simply look at it in terms of of, of just land or in terms of, of of resources, but we have to see first and foremost the control of power. And then it's authority. And I have to say authority because keep in mind, when you especially when you talk about displacement from that standpoint is if I am the authority of, of, of knowledge, the authority in, in the control of, of, of what something means, the definition, the, the pure definition yeah. of it, yeah. then that creates a displacement in thought. And by creating a displacement mm -hmm. in thought, which goes into the term dark psychology, we have right. to remember that even on, look, on, on the way they use the words themselves, when we think dark, <laughs> what do they, they, they think? Evil. They think black. You associate right. it. So if I if I manipulate and and and, and basically redirect or re or, or replace or displace how you think, then right. automatically everything else will fall in line. So now at that point, I should mm -hmm. be in control of power. I am the authority of, mm -hmm. of what the definition mm -hmm. is and what something means, which means mm -hmm. I control perception. So the displacement to me goes into those three those three aspects. And I would say physical, mental, mm -hmm. spiritual, and psychological. Uh, so four. So those whole four things there, we're talking about a complete displacement. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put that out there. Now that's the actual fact, and that actually goes into another principle, right into it. Identity theft. Right? Because if, if the man can convince, if he can defame your uh, identity so bad to where you don't want to be that person, since you're not being that person, he can slide in and assume your identity. Can I tell y'all a quick story? Quick, quick, quick story, man. Some of y'all might already heard it, but this kind of explains identity theft. So one day, it's about 90, 98 degrees. It's real hot outside. And it's truth and lie. And they right there by the pool, right? And they chilling. So lie is scheming on him. He like, man. It's hot as a motherfucker, man. We need to go ahead and jump in this pool. So Truth is like, nah, man, I don't want to be seen swimming with lie. Please. So, you know, he keeps getting at him. Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's just hop in, you know, let's just hop in the pool. So, you know, so then lie start taking off his clothes and stuff. So then Truth was like, man, you know, it is hot, man. Let me go ahead and jump in this. So then Truth took off his clothes and jumped in the water. So he's in the water and stuff, and he's looking around. He don't hear lie in there. So he look over, lied, and put on Truth's clothing. So now lies running down the street, right? So truth is about to chase him and put on lies clothing, but he's like, hold up, man. I don't want to be a truth dressed up as a lie, you know? So he running down the street. Now you got the buck naked truth chasing a well-dressed lie. Who do you think they called the police on? The buck naked truth. 
Butt Naked Truth. Yes, sir. And who do you think they let into their house? The way they dress lot. You see? And this is the this is the irony of identity theft, man. When somebody can kind of undress you from your identity, we look hip hop, we're looking at that right now. Once upon a time they used to do black face, now they're doing black voice. Where somebody has assumed your voice, your style, your swag, and is using it to make millions, maybe if not billions of dollars, and sometimes defaming your culture. You know, using your culture to defame you and make your people look bad and whatnot. And people, you know, kind of accept this person that we call Eminem. I call him Method Mayonnaise. You know, people accept this person. They say he's the best rapper. But this person has assumed another man's identity. But the harsh part of hip hop, the Tupac and Biggie guy, which is in bullets, he ain't, he ain't never dealt with that. He get all the rewards, you know. So... This is this is identity theft. They're trying to say Justin Bieber's the king of pop now. But he took all his moves from, drum roll, please. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't even have to ask that. They tried to say uh, 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 Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. But Elvis Presley disappears into infinity when you put Chuck Berry up. But this shows you identity theft, and they'll do it right in front of your eyes. You know? Chuck Berry had, um, you see, he, the Beach Boys came and just jacked his song directly, man. Just took his words off, put their words on it, you know? And, you know, when, when somebody reduces you to nothing, then people don't look at that as a problem. Anything that people take from you, oh, those people really don't matter. They really don't have a culture. That's just a subculture. That's just slang. Oh, it's just slang, but the whole world is using it now. You know what I mean? White man can't even get no... No, no action if he don't speak like us. <laughs> if he don't dress like us. You know what I mean? If he don't drive his car like us and put rims on it like us. So, and then at this point, we're looking at the whole world involved in this identity theft by way of hip hop. I'm not going to go too much into that one, y'all. I'm going I'm to keep rolling through this. Let me give uh -huh. a scientific definition on that one as well. Come on, family. Come on. Real quick. To I appropriate, appreciate it. To appropriate the science of humanity in order to control the existence of a people. Mm, mm. That's all I had. Okay. okay. Bam, bam. Um, and then to go um, a little more into that, I'm going to talk about uh, tribal gang and religious warfare. Okay. And this is another way they get us to abandon our identity because they associate our identity, our history, our existence with tribal warfare, gang warfare, religious warfare from as far as you can go back to almost anywhere where we are. They're, they put this on the tape. What, what, what they don't show you is that who is it that causes this tribal gang and religious warfare? He hides his hand. You know, oh, isn't it terrible that the, that the, that the, that the Tutus, that the Tutsis and the such and such had a fight over in Rwanda? They don't tell you that, uh, 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 who was it? Uh, uh, Leopold and them was directly involved in that. Belgium and them was directly involved in that, trying to get them to kill each other off so they could get the, what was it, the cobalt. Never show you that. It's, oh, they just, they don't get along and they have tribes. No, no. Usually, this man has come in and armed both sides and then accentuated, you know, whatever the problem is and then steps back. Whether it be religious, whether it be tribal, whether it be gang, what we say, red, white, and blue. Crips on one side, bloods on the other, white folks in the middle, you know? Or uh, Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other side is still white in the middle, you know? But if you let them tell it, if you let them tell it, they didn't have nothing to do with the gang warfare. When they talk about Chicago, they never really tell you how much money kind of goes into that as far as the guns that just pop up randomly in Chicago. They done said this a million times. We don't make no guns and no bullets and whatnot. So somebody has to be feeding this to us for there to be a war. I mean, if me and you don't like each other, family, that's one thing, okay? But if me and you both have a gun and we don't like each other, that changes the whole dynamic, you know? See what I'm saying? And now, now some shit could happen and we're close in proximity and this is what they know and understand and this is how tribal gang and religious warfare continues to go on. 
I, I now we we can say for surety, if you subtract this third entity that has these two brothers or these two gangs or these two religions fighting, if you subtract that third entity with the money and the guns, the fight would probably dissipate. And this is what I heard a sister talking about on the Africa Diaspora channel. She was saying that for the most part in Africa, the fights come up and then people find a way to settle them because people have a lot of love for humanity and for life and for family. But when there's a third entity involved that has an interest, something that they want off of this land, that they want this group to move this group off of this land so they can get this particular land for something, then the war becomes an extenuatedly long war, you see, until they can achieve whatever goal they want to achieve. Tribal gang, religious warfare, you know, and most of our so-called battles, they're going to attribute to that to kind of simplify us and give you the the, uh, the thought that we cannot live in peace and we cannot govern ourselves in a civil way. To just plant that thought in your head that there's, oh, oh niggas can't really get along. They can't live in one community together. They, they can't have one nation. Look at all of their communities. They've fallen apart. Yes, but if you don't put in all of these 11 principles and how they've been working and how much money you've put into them to make them work, then it doesn't really make sense. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Next one, uh, micro-nationalism. Oh, go ahead, family, go ahead. I, I, I wanna add to that one as well. Come on. And I wanna just interject this point. We have to remember what the job of the CIA is. And I mm. really urge our listening audience to, 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 to really just look up what the Come CIA, on. what's their primary, primary being of existence. It is to disrupt, corrupt, yes. and neutralize mm powers in order to interject a perpetual cycle of self-destruction upon that element. Ooh. The CIA would do that uh, to the individual, to the local, to the national, and the international ramp. All of these things... Say that are- one more time, family. One, just one more time, bro. That's, that's hard-hitting, bro. Come on. CIA, the CIA's job is to disrupt, corrupt, and neutralize mm-hmm. powers in order mm-hmm. to interject a perpetual self-destructive cycle. Ooh. which is which which he feeds into the, the concept that we're familiar with as the Willie Lynch mm. and the thing is, is is by doing that it allows it, it makes every other structure other than itself to be weakened and and it creates that that uh, 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 that cycle that continues to uphold its own self self destruction right. so that they can come in again as now the authority of power, or now the authority of definition, they can easily step in and take control of a situation. Mm-hmm. And this is what's done all around the world. One of the mm-hmm. things that a lot of people don't seem to, to, to connect the dots to is that when the United States, be, being the United States, spends more money in military might. Yes, than, sir. Any probably, I think, believe any. I don't remember what the actual statistic, statistic is, but I'm pretty sure it's it, 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 the next five top nations combined or more mm-hmm. than that the fact that the united states spend so much money in military has to do with the fact that they want to have their tentacles out there and create this right. constant flux of chaos to keep everybody else at a, a at a certain state and as long as you do that it allows the united states to maintain world power dynamics and so when we talk about tribal and gang warfare remember mm-hmm. that this this builds in the gaps to anything. So that same concept applies to political structures as well in international. And so the CIA's job is is doing just that. They are making they are making political climates fight against themselves and the people that they that they that they oversee for the sake of being able to interject that self-destructive cycle. Mm -hmm. Which means now the United States can come in as as the uh the, the saving grace with what what is called all, oftentimes foreign aid and through foreign aid basically yeah. all you got now is codependency right. codependency is a weapon that's going to be used to mm-hmm. constantly keep that nation and that people stuck on my my giving of you without you realizing I'm the one that created the problem in the first place so now you're stuck on these re- on, on on what I'm giving you so I'm stripping you of natural resources and giving you wheat. 
and you tend to think that I'm actually doing you a favor by supplying you wheat the whole time you're not realizing that I've stripped you of your own power, your own power base, your own team. Right. So I just wanted that's to throw that out there. No, that's 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 an excellent add-on, family. That's an excellent add-on. And it's, it's it's kind of a vicious cycle that we see. And if you don't pull back, pierce the veil and look behind it and really see, like they say, follow the money, you know, see who's really benefiting in these. Because a lot of times you'll have politicians that have businesses set up in these other places. So they're sending money from America to these businesses that they've set up in China, in Ukraine, in said Israel. And they're intercepting this money. They have offshore, you know, businesses and whatnot. They're feeding their interests, but they're feeding it using our tax dollars, you know. So using the guise of a so-called tribal gang or religious warfare you see what i'm saying because they know those are the buttons that's easy to push to get people to go along with it traditionally right okay so then let's go to another one which feeds this very much misinformation misinformation disinformation now this is a cold one this means basically somebody lying to you but I mean, we're not just going to say it like that because a lie is easy to detect. I say, uh, you know, the sky made out of cotton. You can you can detect that. That's a lie. It's a detectable lie. This is a man who tells you therapeutic lies. He studies you. He sees what would do what the brother Ward just spoke about, dismantle you and break you apart. Then he starts telling these therapeutic lies to other people about you. Let me give you an example. So they knew they couldn't stop Dr. King because he had such a tight hold on the clergy. It's hard to get black people to turn against a preacher man. Okay. So they had to find other stuff to start working on him with. So they started sending him the tapes of him doing whoop de wop They start working on his, his moral character. <laughs> you feel me? Using what? Misinformation. <laughs> And we believe the feds over him. We listen to what they said about him, even though we know they lied about all of us, you know. But this is a misinformation campaign. And then with we, even with the nation, there's some stuff that the nation has done incorrect. But there was a lot of stuff where they made, like I said, therapeutic lies. Stuff that you looked and maybe you wanted to be true. But it's not true. But it works in their agenda to discredit our organizations and our leaders. Misinformation, misinformation. Just and when we're living in an information age, if you have misinformation about yourself, man, you can it can really lead you down some of the wrong roads, and man, and close a lot of doors permanently for you. But because this misinformation campaign was, you know, so locked in, it had so much to do with the American, I guess you could say the American way to lift them up and then shit on us, you know. And once again, it also goes into that denial again. But you can even see the misinformation campaign family just, just on a very light weight level all around you. You know, just the stuff that we know about um, us. Yeah, there's a lot of information out there about us, but then there's a lot of stuff that is just, you know, they put out there like about uh, Nat Turner. The Nat Turner just went and just randomly killed white folks and that. Nah, that's a little more to that, man. But once again, this is their misinformation campaign to where, yeah, you know something, but maybe he didn't took you off on the wrong branch of it. And you're not mm. you're not able to stand strong in it. You know, me, and then we, we spend millions of dollars to go to these colleges to a lot of times, man, get inf the information he's getting in college is strong. Information we get is sometimes it be shaky. So you're a subpar, whatever you are, because you've gotten so much of this misinformation in every field from history to engineering to physics. So much of this information at the behest of him trying to hide so much. Go ahead, Joe. I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. You're saying something? Yeah, I was just going to basically say it, it really speaks on what I said earlier, but I would mm. call this information the weaponization of definition by mm. controlling the source mm. and its source. By okay. doing you control the perception and, yes, the sir. and the critical consciousness. So Thank you, sir. by doing that and having that, that now that weaponizing that definition, everything that somebody else that goes through your school of thought 
Exactly. It's gonna it's this it's gonna going. automatically be coming at it from an inferior position. Uh, right. That's right. That's right. So right. it may have to be misinformation to me and my people. Right. But it's um, but but what by you using it, you are using it from an in inferior position, and you're not using right. it from a position of empowerment. So therefore, right. everything you do creates a subset of yes, inferior parties. Yep. And see. You know, just to add on to that, family, to Panther back on that, think about this for a second. Now, they say that we don't have intelligence as a people. They say we're non-intelligent, right? right? And they say this based upon some fake observations, misinformation. But they created a billion dollar, hundred, maybe hundred billion dollar program that's still running that's called what? The Counter Intelligence Program. program. So we know... Ooh. You know, that's a lie that we don't have intelligence because you're spending a lot of money to counter what? Our intelligence. intelligence. Whose intelligence? That's right. Black intelligence. That's right. <laughs> so we can knock that one right out of there. We know, okay, you wouldn't be spending that much money on somebody who wasn't intelligent. It didn't have some form of intelligence. <laughs> Just yeah. saying. Yeah. You know, follow the money, right? Okay. So, you know, they make it like, oh, you know, well, it's you know, it's the black. Well, no, it's the black and it's the black mind that you're fighting mm -hmm. against. You know, it's the black mind, man, that then brought America from being some little rural sheep herders, man, to the technological giant that it is with all of our inventions and whatnot. They're trying to counter our intelligence. Now, let me jump into that one. One of the counters: entrapment. Now, one, I'm going to go back to crack cocaine. Just the fact that okay. they created the crack, shipped it in, put it in our hands, put it in our community, already had the laws set up to lock you up, already had the laws to make sure you did all of your time, right? Already had the laws yeah. to make sure you couldn't get your rights back after you did your time, which is double jeopardy. <laughs> That's entrapment. We know mm. it's entrapment because they had everything set up. Everything set up, and then they use that to gentrify the communities. You know, An another uh, principle of white um, um, white supremacy: the displacement. You know, that door, the entrapment, opened the door to the displacement. Displacement. Wow. See, I mean, it's it's like a web. You know, it's like, and at the middle of the web, you see a big W S. White supremacy. You know, and all of its tentacles is reaching out to slap your ass. So. Then this is one that we're kind of that we kind of recently read into uh, 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 Ed first, man, because when people like Prince learn the, 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 you know, the line between genders, people like Michael Jackson, Ready for the World, you know, a lot of very feminine type, you know, musicians, man, they pushed the Teddy Pendergraft, the brothers with the deep voices to, to the back, man. They said, nah, we want to, you know. The sweet singing fellas, you know, <laughs> right? So they started blurring the line between gender. But even if you look at language, man, all languages, okay, in Spanish, you say senor and senorita, you know? And there's a certain way you say stuff that you say it to a woman as opposed to if you say it to a man. So we see this in most languages throughout the world, you know, where there's a, a gender division in the language, how you address people. However, mm -hmm. in, in, in white culture, man, there's a lot of Uncle Elizabeths, right? And Auntie Peters, you feel me? Where they blear the line, they blear the line. And I think it might have something to do with the pineal gland being calcified so therefore, there's certain glands that do not fully activate or are confused, you know, without that melanin to tell it to do this or to do that. So today we're at a point where we're seeing a lot of our people dealing with what we call gender confusion. What is the role of the man? What is the role of the woman? How do they balance each other? You know what I mean? And when you're looking at white supremacy and white so-called culture, there's always been a war between the white man and the white woman. He's trying to be her, she's trying to be him. The white woman is more masculine than the white man. And the white man is more feminine than the white woman. So there's a lot of gender confusion that they've had for a long time.
going back and forth, doing stuff to each other, man. Brothers doing it to sisters, husbands doing it to wives, etc. And we can stand back and see that. I don't think black people really have that problem, but they have drug, drug us into it, man, and used it to put another crack in our community, you know, in between man and woman. We have some issues, but most of our issues stem from white supremacy, not from each other, you know, but let them tell it. Let them tell it. It's we all hate each other and black men and black women can't get along together unless if the white man is there cracking the whip on us, you know. Now, let me just say this. As an individual, you might be able to, to deal with one of these or two of these. But you get hit with this 11-piece snack pack combination punch, and it's usually a knockout. Best if you don't see the, the, the combination coming. And this is kind of where we're at today, y'all. We're being hit with this combination, 11-piece snack pack combination, man. Upstairs, downstairs. You see, and it knocked most of us out. That's why you see most of us unable, disabled, you know, because we've been hit with this. Now, if you have some defenses, if you know how to roll with these punches, you know, if we're doing it as a collective, then we can fight this off. But not only are we dealing with these 11 different principles, we're dealing with organizations of organizations, groups of groups, brotherhoods made up of brotherhoods putting these joints upon you. So it's definitely a team endeavor, man. We would be like Michael Jordan playing against the very best NBA All-Star team all by himself. He might score, but he's definitely not going to win. No. He gonna, in fact, he, at some point, he's going to get shut down because this, this is a team endeavor, and they understand that about us. A lot of these things that I'm dealing with, they strip us from our group identity in order to do this to us as individuals because you can't do this to a strong group you can only do this to a weak individual you know and this goes into them using division subtraction against our multiplication and addition you see okay i'm gonna stop there because y'all done got quiet and i'm like uh oh now so is that <laughs> <laughs> y'all done got quiet <laughs> pardon me um Oh, go! Oh, what you gonna say, no. some war? I was just asking now, if he covered all, that was the cover of all eleven. Yeah, he covered yes, all sir. eleven. Uh, he well, covered all eleven. One, one, one. On, the only one I didn't cover didn't, was micro nationalism. Oh, yeah. Pardon me, micro nationalism and the four devils. And mm -hmm. I think the four devils kind of bleeds into micro nationalism because the four devils: envy, greed, lust, and hate. Okay. So, and that's kind of that group trauma thing. Because if you notice, if you look at a lot of our organizations, they never really say this, okay? But look close. That's usually what destroys most of our organizations internally. Not the external forces, but the internal forces that destroy it is that envy between two brothers, lust, this man want this one, this man's well for this man's woman, right? Hate, he hate this man because he can't be him, right? The greedy fighting against the needy. Right. These are the things which tear our organizations apart from the inside. But the thing that flips that thing that flips that them four devils is brotherhood and sisterhood, because then it says, hey, man, no matter how much money I got, no matter how much money you got, you, my brother, I'm your, I'm your, you know, etc. We got to put this together and make something bigger. Because irregardless of how much money you got, or how much money I got, I'm still black. They still going to treat me and you like you black. You might think you're green, but they think you're black. Okay, so then this goes into micro-nationalism. Let me, let, let me tell you how I play into micro-nationalism because at a certain point, you become afraid to move out of a small clique and form bigger groups, right? On some xenophobia because you've dealt with so much envy, greed, lust, and hate. Or you see that operating over here in this group that you kind of want to get with, but you're like, well, I don't want to jump into them four, four devils. You know, I'm already dealing with it on a personal thing, so I'm not trying to throw they shit on top of my shit. That's a lot of shit. Excuse my French, you know. Yeah. Because my I know my shit stank. So I mix my shit 
with your shit, it's gonna it's gonna really, 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 really stack. So how about I clean up my shit, you clean up your shit, and then we kind of come together. And this is the thing of you know micro nationalism. This is the the only way it can the only way we can reverse it, y'all. If we start doing some house cleaning, you know, and that way when I look over at my brother's house, I'm like, damn, his house look good over there. I need to go over there and get some pointers from him. And he looking over at my house and saying, ooh. I like the way that brother's grass is cut, man. The way his house is painted. I need to go get some pointers from him. You know, and now it becomes a community effort of self-improvement and what? Refinement. <laughs> yeah, man. And that's what take us into what I'm calling LBC. Livable Black Cities. Livable be, black be, cities, family. Before you know? before we go into the LBC, uh, brother Magnetic, before we, yes, before we get in, before we go to Long Beach, California, <laughs> before we go yes, to LBC, though, <laughs> I wanted to uh, I wanted to back up just just well, not really back up, but build on something before we go there Come on. because we've talked about white supremacy. Yes, and sir. I think is I think is, and we kind of talked about what we think it is. You know, right. we talked about. We got two brothers that hadn't had a chance to say anything, so I might pick on them yep. Come in a on. minute to get their perspective because they might they might be sleeping giants. They might be sitting there with some something extremely powerful to say, and they just sitting there quiet. So I might pick on those brothers in a hot second. But Come we on. talked about white supremacy, and I think that is I think that when you have that discussion, it's kind of important to pin down not only what it is, but why it is. You know, mm -hmm. if you think about that. We talking about mm -hmm. what it is, and you know mm -hmm. there'll be some people watching that will sit that sit to themselves and say, "Well, why would a group of people go mm -hmm. through all of this?" You mm -hmm. just broke down the eleven principles. You know, uh, 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 there are other people that have broke down many other things. I think Dr. Right. Umar has has yep. one on uh, on YouTube. What he goes over, he, what what he sees as the principles of white supremacy. Dr. Neely Fuller of the ISIS papers, the case of colors by Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. Mm -hmm. I mean Wilson, excuse me. So so we got a lot of breakdowns. But you might ask mm -hmm. somebody might ask why would an entire race of people? Mm -hmm. how, matter of fact, how could an entire race of people completely come together and decide and agree that we're going to institute a system? Right of racism and white supremacy against another group of people, you know, and why would somebody right. do that? that? That almost sounds insane. You know, why would somebody do mm -hmm. that? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's easier to believe that this has not happened, you know, and I got, and again, I got to play the devil's right. advocate because y'all are being too quiet. Maybe this, maybe this hasn't happened. And I want to mm -hmm. ask this question specifically to brothers Nehemiah and brother Rich. Why do y'all think that do, not, not, not only what do y'all think white supremacy is and why do y'all think a group of people would implement this type of system? Why? Mm -hmm. I mean, it almost sounds crazy. Brother Rich, you, I seen your finger. Up. Uh, uh, you got to unmute yourself. What you uh, what you think? You know, what is white supremacy? and Why do you think a group of people would implement that type of system against another group of people? Why? I guess, you know. You would think like, why would these people do it? The the the, the truth of the matter is, is this is this is a culture. This is a group of people born of fear, hunger, and want. Mm -hmm. well, once they get to a place where they can they can have those things, procure or acquire those things, they go all out to create systems that will protect them and keep them in place and have those things. Even if they take a bunch of people, they're gonna like uh, Dr. Amy Lucy said. He said, uh, these people will steal from people and then turn around and say, uh, the Bible says no stealing. It's against the law to steal after I have stolen from you. You know what I mean? So right. people created a culture. These people were born in a in a in a place and in, in a mentality that they had to impose with force on their neighbors, on their mothers, on their children, on their on their their, their own animals, on nature, they had to impose their will on things. So the 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 to the level and degree that they practice imposing a will on nature, because they were they were in, in, in complete competition with nature. Everything was out to murder them. So mm -hmm. born of fear and, and aggression and anxiety, and uh, and coming amongst the people who represent nature, of course they they have they they have learned to to mm -hmm. to 
out of nature. You know what I'm saying? They they learn to war with nature. They learn to war with their peers. Of course, they learn to war with themselves. So when you come amongst the people who represent nature, who represent earth, who represent all these things that you have been warned against forever, of course, it's easy for you to, to, to dominate and subdue it because you've been doing it for so long. It's like cutting down a tree or building a house. It's just, it's just birth nature to you now. So these people create these systems out of fear. And then, you know what? It takes me to this point in uh, um, in the Avengers when uh, uh, um, Iron Man says, see, see, I told y'all, y'all should have Everybody wants this, uh, everybody wants these rights. I want, I want to put a shield around the earth so nothing can come to it. So out of fear, you know what I'm saying? They use their intelligence to create weapons and blockades and limitations and boundaries and rules, you know what I'm saying? To protect the core of what they really are. And that's like uh, uh, the children. You're, they're culturally adolescents. You know I mean? they, they have been designed. They, they've grown. They, they've created systems and imposed these systems on people and indoctrinated people to carry on that design to create the same uh, uh, sense of fear, aggression, and want in other people. So we sitting here war with each other because we think we're reflecting what the fuck these people taught us. You know what I mean? So Go in deep. It, Go in deep. That's yes, your and I want to I want to expand on, on what Brother Rich said right quick. I want to kind of expand on that uh, uh, and kind of build on it. He said that you're dealing with a people that came out of fear. And if you understand this, and I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible, but if you understand this, you have to understand the environment. The environment is very important, but you got to mm -hmm. understand the environment that Europeans came out of. You got to understand what the environment looked like. Rich just told you that nature was trying to kill them. Europeans, well, Europeans are late comings on the on the planet Earth, and the environment that they came out of was the complete opposite of the environment that we came out of. Their environment was completely surrounded <laughs> by ice glaciers. Their history called this is called this the Ice Age, yep. and they could not travel out of Europe. So you got to understand that it was extremely cold. That's one yep. thing, and that's one thing about that's one thing about God, nature, evolution, whatever you want to call it. The symbols are always there. Their their environment was extremely cold. What is, <laughs> what is the thing that you say about yep. a person that, that lacks emotion? You say that they're cold blooded. Cold. That's what you cold say. Blooded. So their yep. environment, they're cold blooded. That's mm -hmm. what you say. A snake is cold blooded. So their Rip environment snake. was extremely cold, and because it was cold, when was the last time you seen an apple growing in the snow? In the ice, he, in, the, in the freezing, in the, in the freezing ice. He's a former. Yeah. He ain't gonna tell me because he don't want to talk. But when was the last time you seen bananas grow in the freezing cold? It just doesn't happen. So they yeah. didn't have access to fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables and things like this. And you gotta understand how important fruits and vegetables are because they're the main mm -hmm. source that you get the essential vitamins and minerals from. Vitamin, mm -hmm. if you think about it, the vital minerals that your human body needs in order to develop brain tissue, eyes, beta carotene develops your, the, the, uh, the, the, the lenses in your eyes, eyes, mm -hmm. skin, hair, nails, everything needed to develop and move you to the next level of evolution, which is the homo sapiens sapiens, the conscious man, the man that we are right now. So they didn't have that. So you got a people that's sitting in this freezing cold, completely surrounded by ice glaciers. And everything in nature is trying mm -hmm. to murder them. Hell, the animals yeah. are trying to eat, so the animals are hunting them down. Yeah, Hell, the cold is trying to kill them. So, so to this people, <laughs> to them, their thought process, their entire culture, their, their entire mm -hmm. psychology that develops out of this type of environment right. is yeah. it's a dog eat dog world. Yeah. I gotta get mine, so I gotta take yours. You you got yeah, people man. coming out coming from from lack. They coming from there's not enough. So I have to make to make sure that I can eat. I have to kill the next thing living to make sure that I'm protected and taken care of. We have to remove our emotions from it. We got to remove everything we think we know about it. We got to put it even aside the color thing. We got to right. understand that this is mentality. They're a culture. Their mm -hmm. environment developed a culture that that they end up once the ice glaciers melt melted and they was able to actually travel out of Europe. They came, they brought that culture with them. And the culture was a culture of, as Rich said, a culture of fear, a culture of lack. They they came to realize, man, it ain't mm -hmm. that much food. It ain't that much. You exactly. know, it ain't that much. So I got to make sure I can get what I can get. So now, now let me freeze that right quick. Let me freeze it. Now let's go to Africa. 
And the, at the exact same time that these people was going through that in Europe and Africa, in mm -hmm. Africa, they they uh fruits are growing naturally without us even trying. So you have access to apples, to bananas, to whatever it is. You got mm -hmm. full access to it. You got access to all the animals. You got you got rivers that are, that are flowing. You have access to clean water. You have access to the, all the things that a human being needs to move to the next level. Now, I'm, I'm trying not to make this too long, but it's kind of hard to explain this without being scientific. It's kind of hard not to do it. In mm -hmm. Europe, in Europe, if we dealing with this from an evolutionary standpoint, and one thing I want want people to understand that's watching the viewing audience, when you hear evolution, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't believe in God. You know, it doesn't mean that. I know it's a lot of religious people that hear evolution and think, oh, I don't want to hear nothing he has to say because he doesn't believe in God because that's another thing that Europeans do. You're, you're either or. You either believe right. God created human beings or you believe evolution created human beings. And then, mm -hmm. but you got to understand that sometimes you can understand that maybe God used evolution to create human beings. Maybe evolution is the process that was used because it's always a process. There's never a thing, there it is. There is a mm -hmm. process that takes mm -hmm. place in order for things to be developed. So sure. when we understand when we understand evolution, we start to understand that in Europe, the the the, the, the so-called human, because we can't call it a human, they only evolved to the level of Homo erectus. That's it. That's far as they got. And they stopped. Right. Homo erectus. He, didn't, he got some of the man. He didn't get the hue. Yeah, yeah, he didn't get all this of This is how we get to it, white supremacy. Because you see it, what I'm in saying? Africa, in see. Africa, we evolved completely to Homo sapiens. We evolved yeah. completely to the Homo sapiens, which is the human. And there it, you go. And, and scholars, scholars say that uh, anthropologists say that the gene to become the Homo, the homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. had to be had to be taken into Europe through African migrations after the ice yep. glaciers melted and mating had to take place with the Europeans in order for them to become the, the first European homo <laughs> sapien on the on the fossil record they call him the cro magnon man yeah and this and this man came came about I think 60 thousand 30 or 60 thousand years ago I can't remember when the first yeah, that was homo the like the homo sapien yeah the, uh, uh, that was on, the, the fossil record the Grimaldi's, yeah, was it, they went was into it the France. Grimaldi's? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. The Grimaldi's and, went into France and whatnot. Yep, yeah. and a lot of the so-called Etruscans as well. The first African on the on the fossil record that was a Homo <laughs> sapien was a hundred thousand years ago. Right, right. Compared to the European who is thirty to sixty thousand years ago, because it took the right. African to mate with him to give him that last gene that he just simply did not that have because his environment didn't have it. Right. Now. I'm, I'm, and I'm gonna close it out with this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to this point. So I, I'm, I'm trying to show you what Africa and Europe looked like, you know, in the environments that that, that we came up in. Because we got to understand that culture comes from our environments. We develop culture, which is basically a way of life, based on the environments that we come from. And in our environment, nature loved us. It seemed like nature was blessing us. So we developed a culture that made us one with nature. Well, we saw the sun as a mother or father. Well, we saw the earth as a mother. We looked at the land as something that was protecting us and taking care of. Where the European looked at the land as something that was trying to eliminate him. So in his thinking, he developed a, a mind state that I have to dominate and conquer everything that I see my eyes, lay, lay my eyes on. Because if I don't, it's going to kill me. Because that's his experience. That's his culture. Yeah. And he came out and met other people, people of color, black people, red people, yellow people, whatever group of people that he met, he met mm -hmm. them. And in his mind, while these people were celebrating and dancing and kicking it, as he called them savage or, or underdeveloped, in his mind, he's like, man, they tripping. They don't know an ice, a ice age could come any minute, take right. wipe all the food yeah. out. They don't right. know this. I need to take over this, conquer them, take the apples, take the food, take the land, take as much as I can before I get attacked by another ice age. You know, yeah. this is his thinking. And the, but and then, the African, as soon as the he take American, over, then the sun burn his ass up. <laughs> and that's, again, that's where it is. Nature is trying to kill him. So, so you have to understand where his thinking comes from. So I said right. all that to say this. Said all of that to say this. Because breaking that down is a, is a show on its own. But I said all of that just to simply say this. That you have to understand that that's why he developed a system of global white supremacy to protect mm -hmm. his, his what he thought was his interest. 
That's why he developed. Even in white supremacy is an emotional aspect that doesn't even really that doesn't that isn't even really required for the system, but it's to keep all white people protecting and feeding the system of white supremacy. And that's mm -hmm. the idea that you are the superior person on the planet. You yeah, are the yeah. and, and, and and they bought into that. Even when mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Martin Luther King said this to white people. He said and he directed it to poor whites. He said right. He said, and I can't remember the, the quote verbatim, but you can read it in a book. Where do we go from uh, chaos of community? Where do we go from here? It's the yeah, last yeah. book that he wrote. And he said in this book, he said that, that white people should be marching with us. They should be protesting mm -hmm. against the system with us. He said, mm -hmm. he said, because they're being oppressed the same way that we are. The only mm -hmm. thing is they don't realize it because they're still yeah. holding on to the only thing, benefit that they get from this system. And that's the, that's, the white supremacist idea that they are better than everybody else when they're suffering just like us. I love that you made that point because that's the normalized insanity family right there, which is this false advertisement that's been given to white people, but it leads them into the insanity that we see where they're complicit with some stuff that does not make sense. It's counterproductive for the entire planet, but they're thinking there's, there's a beacon at the top of the hill somewhere that's coming. They kind of, you know how they say we got sold a dream. They told us we could receive more gold, which was more than receiving, was more than receiving our own land. They got sold a lie too, man, because the poor whites stay poor. You see, they stay poor, man, and they keep them right there because they're following that that lie that they're a part of this power that they're not a part of. You know, no, so that's why I say it's a, it's it's a normalized insanity. Definitely, because at any given time, that poor, that they, that old rich white uh, politician can reach into that poor white trash and pull him right up into position. So that's a pool that they pull from. You know what I'm saying? In the independent, independent country, the the higher <laughs> up white uh, 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 organizations pull from a smaller little organization. You know, you got the Aryan Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. They pull from the Pecker Woods and the Pecker Woods uh, look for other, they scout for other little tough looking white dudes and bring them into the Pecker Woods and then they uh, uh, initiate them into the AV, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it, it's uh, it's just a no. whole thing that at any given time, that poor white trash Pecker Wood who was right there beside you, Poe playing uh, uh, a slapjack and, and, and pinochle, at any given time, he. Well, hey, what are you doing there, Come on over here. We're going to take care of you. Well, I got to go, uh, uh, Leroy. They've been, they about to take care of you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You in the game. Yeah, that's funny. Right. You got elevated. You got elevated in the race. You got to go. You start like hey, damn, I thought you was down. <laughs> <laughs> so it was real white folks. They ain't going to let you like no nigga. ain't going to be no niggas around. You're going to get your mind right. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. Let me uh let me give a, a, a definition to what we're talking about as well. Just so uh oh, those in the listening audience know what we're talking about. That that goes into the concept when we talk about what the environments they came from, and then we equate that to what's going on now. That that right. goes to what's called epigenetics. So we're talking about epigenetic traits of collective survival uh, that caused the development of a prime supremacy. See, we have to recognize mm -hmm. what the term is that we're dealing with. It's called a crime right. supremacy. And it was a result of, of the type of survival that they had to develop, which became a principal approach to self-preservation. And so mm -hmm. because of the prime supremacy, which meant their self-preservation, uh, it completely, in order for us to be able to stay at the bottom and to be inferior, that means they had to attack the, attack the heart of our self determination as a people. Exactly, this exactly. is why this this is why there's a natural uh um 180 degree shift between what works for them and what's right for them automatically is the opposite for us because in yeah. order for a prime supremacy to establish itself and to maintain mm -hmm. its hold you have mm -hmm. to you have to employ again like the tactics like I bring up when I talk about the CIA you got to employ a methodology throughout the world structure that creates mm -hmm. the that, that destroys and attacks anything that has to do with self determination. Wow, so and you know the secrecy of it, y'all, is the coldest part of it. I don't want to go on too much longer, but when you see them and they got the hand inside of their breast pocket, those pictures that's yeah. talking about the hidden hand, and 
whenever you see a black organization that kind of looks like it's doing some good stuff and then it just kind of randomly ends up kind of coming apart, dismantling, it's usually that hidden hand, you know? And wow. I wanted to make sure that I bring my brother, brother Nehemiah in, to, you know, to, to <laughs> add some, to stack some bricks on this, this building, uh, man. Okay. I know you got some bricks to stack on top. Come on, family. <laughs> Well, on this day of justice, let's talk about it. Um, so uh, what seems to be is that this is a psycho white supremacy is a psychological operation. Uh, as much as we talk about the strength, as much as we talk about the brute force of white supremacy, we know that uh, number wise and as well as our collective strength, we know it can only happen through a manipulation of some sort. So as the brother had gave forth the definition or uh, to define it, crime supremacy. That sounds like, uh, that is correct, right? That's what he said. Sounds wow. like he, uh, sounds like it, uh, there's a manipulation of justice here. There's a manipulation of a universal law. And as we vibrate one way, they vibrate the other way. If we're infected with this vibration that makes us repel and uh, against uh, our natural way of life, then we are ultimately those who suffer the most. Um, as you talk about fear base, we were infected with the fear based uh, uh, religious ideology. Uh, the Christianity they gave us is not ultimately the original, original Christian uh, doctrine in Africa. However, what they gave gave us a, a bastardization. We must call it a bastard because it denies its roots. It denies its father. It denies its mother and acts as though it is a, a spawn of its own doing, as though it is self-created. And as uh, these form of governments, even their government is a bastardization and they fed it to us. Uh, their form of democracy is not even the original form of democracy. And uh, and what's really republic about their republic? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I see a demo in the democracy. <laughs> you know, a, a little demolition, a little demonstration, a little, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> uh but uh, as we get to what is white supremacy? Well, let's look at it on as far as uh, the lighting. It's white light, black light. Uh, when you have white light and you have black light, or you have a rainbow, there's a refraction, a reflection of some sort of an illusion. Uh, white supremacy would be equivalent to the white light. It separates everything. It claims it's organizing, but truly it's subduing the frequencies of other waves. Black light throws everything all in together, gives collective power where it must be. Um, and as we see that, we must talk about the melting pot. You know, white America, the melting pot, Lady Liberty, give me your sick, give me your lame, whatever. Just don't give me the nigga. That's what Lady Liberty said. Give me everybody. Just don't give me the nigga. Ooh, okay. Ooh. And as she is liberty, meaning liberation, and uh, she rules with her sister, Justina, justice, who's blind, but yet the scales always seem to know the carbon ratio. I, I don't get it. Oh. So as we see white supremacy, it is a psychological operation to destroy the black collective conscious. If uh, the definition of black was given to me, or as I heard it, I wasn't there. I was, you know, the video, the highlights and the playback is amazing. It lives on forever. Um, but black was said to be more of a, 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 a consciousness. It was said to be a corresponding connection to the cosmos. And that blackness is said to be our culture. So uh, cosmos, we know, is a divine order. Again, if we're living something that's unnatural, it's not our natural selves. Um, you could go uh, Black Liberation 101, go into the Bible, 
uh, the chopping block that the Balaam was to teach to Balak, to subdue, uh, to put before the children of Israel so that they would uh, fall in the land of Shittim. They were taught ways to worship what the invader did, and that was for their destruction. And these ways of doing what the uh, overlord, the slave master, the tyrant, the uh, the foreign overlord, whatever Hyksos means, all of these type of uh, mixed desert, wherever they came from. We've seen these people, like you said, they were fear-based. The Hyksos came to Kemet, claimed that somebody was stealing their goods, claimed that it was a famine in their land, claimed someone was trying to imprison them and make them pay tribute. And then these Hyksos soon turned around and did what? The very same acts that were done to them. Even as we see now with the Zionists, uh, 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 um, let me not go in. Um, but we see that everything they do on the fear base, that uh, what's, the, what's the slogan, never again? Well, their never again has made it uh, to where they're doing acts that were committed to them upon other races, upon other groups, ethnic groups of people. Even them claiming other people are anti-Semitic, that is a psychological operation right. that's shielding their anti-Semitism. Uh, as we see what they have done to the Palestinian people, that's anti-Semitic more than just some uh, so-called bigot sentences. Uh, so this exposes white supremacy again. It exposes because, as you say, it's a crime, uh, a crime supremacy or a crime culture. Can't remember how you laced that up. Well, it was clean like a new pair of boots. But I tell you what, um, but. Uh, uh, that's that's what the con does. That's what the uh, sham does. That's what the guy who's trying to get over on you does. He uses what he knows, you know. He uses his lessons and just, you know, nudges you to the edge till you fall off. It's to your detriment. So when we go against our culture, when we go against our black collective consciousness, and it's sick, it's toxic, and it's nothing that can replenish us. Like Brother said, it's not the uh, vital minerals. <laughs> Hey man, a trash diet is gonna lead to a trash body, you know. You you know? So our black collective consciousness has to be restored, and it has to be collective in order for us to fight this. Uh, and we have to call it great white supremacy. When we call it a uh, this decadent system, decadent. Uh, this this what we're fighting against is not a one man show. It's not a one group and one person. You know, we need that black united front, but we need that black collective consciousness to fight against this white supremacy. You know what I'm saying? You see pictures of Malcolm pointing to the mind. You hear people speaking great orators with a uh, great galvanizing speech. These people are speaking out of our mind. The mind is at the top of your body because the mind uh, is at the top of all things. So we must repair the mind in order for the body, uh, the body, which is this movement, um, in order for it to go in the right direction, the mind must be guided. The mind right. must be leading towards the right direction. Sorry for the long windedness kind of got off the cut somewhere and ended up in the field, but I brought it back to the street. Um, uh, thank y'all. All right. Magnetic, go ahead and go into, uh, Thanks, the second, the next section where you was talking about the uh, black livable cities. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, because as we're going into the future, y'all, as we um, seriously looking into the future, you know, we all remember times within our communities when our communities were more livable. You know, um, some of us are a little young, so maybe your time might be shorter that you remember that. But most of us remember a time where the black community was more livable. When I say livable, I mean man, woman, and child, right? Okay, we had black schools. We had supermarkets you could go to where there's it's the type of products that you eat and that you like and that you that you want. Okay. Uh, there was some degree of safety and security within the place that you live and the places that you was going to. Um, it wasn't overrun with a lot of foreigners and drugs. At this point, all those things that we considered homeostasis that made a city, a place, a community livable 
all these things have been removed. And um, um, once again, that goes into the displacement. <laughs> that goes into the displacement because the places where we have been centered at, y'all, is what I call the 16 black meccas, okay? And I call it the six, I'm gonna say it again, and mecca mean metropolitan economic center of culture and commerce for Afro-Asiatics, M-E-C-C-A, you know? So when we start discussing these places, we have them in the West Coast, on the East Coast, Midwest, and in the South, okay? And if not, not these particular cities that our people are in, then use these centers somewhere around these cities, okay? I'm gonna start with the West Coast. The West Coast, Seattle and Tacoma, that's one. Okay, then we got Portland, Oregon, that's number two. Then we got Los Angeles, then we got Oakland. So that's that's four meccas, okay? Then if we go to the, uh, to the South, we're talking about Oklahoma, Texas, New Orleans, Mississippi, that's, that's one, and then Georgia and Alabama. So Oklahoma, Texas, New Orleans, Mississippi, Georgia and Alabama, that's the South. Then we go to the East Coast, we're talking about New York, we're talking about Philly, we're talking about that DMV, and we're talking about North Carolina. We go to the Midwest, we're talking about St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, and Ohio. Now, you y'all could probably think, either if you know people there or you got people, uh, Kim folks, that's there. Some of y'all might be from some of these other places, even though you in wherever you at. So that's why, I, and these are the cities that we as a people, we have a lot of landmarks there. We have a lot of history there. We have a lot of family there. We spend a lot of money. The place, the money that has developed these places is our black tax dollars. That's what built these high schools. That's what built these roads. That's what developed these places. Most of the time, our ideas, our ingenuity developed these places. We think it's some philanthropic white person, but when you start digging and really looking, hey man, if a white dude got slaves available, he ain't doing no work. And there haven't been no time in America's existence where there was no slaves on deck. So everything you see that requires some physical back work, that's you, and you understand? And they'll tell you, during the great migration, we were brought to all these big cities, right? They said six million of us came from the South to all of the bays to build these cities. So let me kind of wrap this up a little bit, y'all. Um, you know, I started out with the 11 principles of white supremacy because you have to think, well, why is it we have all these cities, these 16 black meccas that push commerce, that push culture, man, that push pretty much the culture of the world and of this country, but they're not connected. Well, then you have the 11 principles of white supremacy and so many other ones that we could add to it. You know what I mean? That we have to become conscious of. Look, opposition ain't never going to go away. You know, it's always going to be somebody that want to whoop your ass. So before you learn how to throw a punch, you learn how to move around punches, how to defense, how to block, right? How to make him run into your punches and make it to where you run, a, you know, you get away from his punches. You make him think he going hit, to get, hit, get it. Bam, you tag him before he could tag you. And this is what we're asking. This is what uh, I would say mentality. And I would say uh, that, Supreme mind allows us to be able to do, man, to where we kind of fall into a rotation. If you ever watch a boxer, he's not really even looking at you, but he's moving all around your punches, right? It's almost intrinsic. He moving all around your, he making you look totally ridiculous, man. Every time you try to move in. And this is kind of how we have to be with these principles, man, in order to establish these 16 black meccas, because they ain't going to never stop. White supremacy ain't going to never stop. And if we try to sit here and try to figure it out, we will go as crazy as the white man is. Right or wrong. But what we can do is protect our 16 black meccas from all of these wild animals that have been created here in the wilderness of North America. Wild animals that are disguised as people. You see? And um, we see a lot of so-called immigrants coming in. They're saying they're coming from south of the border, but a lot of them is coming from other countries across the Atlantic. You see, a lot of them coming from China, a lot of them coming from Syria, a lot of them coming from Russia, etc. And we know as black people, whenever these so-called immigrants come in, our communities are the place that are 
usually most vulnerable to these attacks. You see what I'm saying? White communities, they be having white, you know, police driving around, watching. They got private security, etc. We're yeah. the ones that are most vulnerable to this, you know? These 16 black meccas. So we're coming to a point, y'all, that's not even really going to be enough white people just to keep, to keep it a buck. Who used to be the people that kind of defended the nation, you know, National Guards. There's not even really enough white people to defend your black meccas. That's why we're seeing it being overrun. A lot of them, the police tapped the fuck out. They said, I'm cool. I'm not doing this. It ain't my people I'm saving. My people almost did. We won 2% of the population of the world. If I'm, if, if they saving somebody, they would be saving us. They said, I'm cool, man. They did the same thing in the Civil War. They said, we're not going to fight for a nigga to be free and for niggas to have privileges. We going to Canada or we going to Mexico. And the people end up fighting is me and you. That ain't what they tell you in the story, but that's really what happened. And this is what it come back to today, y'all. Defending our 16 black meccas. Number one, like, like the God, Robert Boyd said, defending the idea, of the history of that belongs to you and me. You know what I mean? Say it right. Los Angeles was founded by a black man. Chicago founded by a black man. You know what I mean? Say it right. First village in New York was Seneca Village, you know? Let's say it right. The people that founded Miami, Miami, is the Seminoles. The people that founded California was the Khalifas. Let's say it right. That's maintaining and defending the integrity of the idea. You know, that's that's that, that's where we at. And once people begin to see the idea, live the idea, love the idea, man, people will fuck you up over something they love. It could even be a piece of cake. Straight up, yeah, we know that. Oh, yeah. The same. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but let me with regards to the black meccas. Yes, so sir. what would be the significance of of, of talking about that or even going back and saying the history of these of, of, of the different places founded by black people when we're not the ones that are in positions of power? There's a book currently out oh. that was written uh, a few years ago called The Devil You Know by a guy named mm. Charles. And he basically what I see is attempting to re-implement the same strategy that mm -hmm. the Third mm -hmm. Development Black Panther Party did when they pulled back the national, uh, all of the different chapters and say, hey, mm -hmm. let's concentrate and focus our power on Oakland. Right. And when they did that, it 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 actually, it, remember, this was a change in the ideology of the organization. Yep. Right. So it, it went from Black Power, implementing Black Power, to actually implement aspects of reformism. So yeah. when identifying the black meccas and and, oh, and, and showing our, our levels of strength there or where the yeah. word strength could be because we have the the uh, the numbers to do so, mm -hmm. what are we saying in regards to that as it applies to fighting and uh, dealing with the the uh, the aspects of what you refer to as the principles of white supremacy? In other words, let's talk about problem solution. We identify the problem, with, Come on. And, a pattern, right. and that pattern would be that white supremacy. So I'm, I'm so glad you said that, family, because the main thing that keeps them in control of our 16 black meccas is three things, okay, that they control, that we allow them to control. One is information, right? The information that we get about each other and the information we get about reality, right? And two is communication. They kind of regulate and control our communication, right? which is how we distribute this information. The third one being transportation. So we have to master the information, the communication, the transportation. Without that, you cannot have organization or a nation. So this right here, this information that we're, you know, getting together to consolidate and then giving out to people about, hey, if we're talking about who we are, we have to know where we are. If we're talking about our people, okay, you're talking about our people. Well, where are these people <laughs> in the 16 black meccas or usually centered around them? You see, and when we start, if we organize like this, going to these 16 points and then around there, we do little fact finding games to figure out if our people have been displaced, where are they at? We know there's somewhere around Cleveland. We know there's somewhere around Chicago. We know there's somewhere around Atlanta. We know there's somewhere around Los Angeles, close in the proximity of it then we can really start to really dial in the the the, the where about the who, you know? Because you got to know where they at, man. You got to know where they at, man. Maybe they used to be in Brownsville, 
Maybe they used to be on Hastings Street, but maybe they're a few miles up the street. And once we start to dial into that, man, now we got a real map. And then that green book that we had, you see, to where when I go to these different, to where when I go to these different cities, I don't go, I don't run into the white part on accident. Uh-oh, oh man, black people used to live here. Oh man, where do I find the black people at? And you gotta, you know, we should already have that. And to a certain point, as people tour these different cities, they should say, I wanna go on the black power tour. They call you brother war because they in San Diego. They say, hey man, give me the black power tour. Show me all the black monumental places, the major high schools, where this person lived and whatnot, where the biggest black church was at, where the first black uh, Panther party office was at. They come to you brother Nehemiah. Hey man, take me to Martin Luther King house, man. Show me where some of the monumental to this bridge and that, but show me where SNCC used to stay at when they was down here in Alabama. Take me to the um the the the, the Los County Freedom you know grounds and whatnot where they had the uh where they had the tents and stuff you know they come to you brother P brother Richard they say hey man I, what city are you from family San Antonio San Antonio man I know they got some some Black Power monuments down there you know and you drive us around you might be introduced or even if you just take us to the best restaurants bro hey a date with a plate I will not hate I hear you know? Well, that make okay. that changed the whole trip, the, the whole trip, family. And these are the type of things I'm talking about, family. Because a lot of times we go to um, a black city, but we get a white tour. Yeah. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. uh -oh, take, you. take you all the white restaurants, all the white hotel, you know, right? All the just corny. It's like going to Africa and only going on a safari. Going to McDonald's, not going to Africa, going to McDonald's. Yeah, you, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me let me you know. know. Let me throw a, a wrench in, in, in that real quick then for us to ask. Uh -oh. kind of back to something I, I, I've been trying to get people to focus on simply because I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is when we talk about revolutionaries, we talk about it from the standpoint of, of our realm of social revolution. Uh. And, and, and you brought up uh, basically information, transportation, and communication. There is a current man right now who is the living day modern day version of a tony stark named elon musk who has revolutionized information through starlink transportation through spacex and mm. community through neuralink mm. you have one man that owns multiple types of, of, of te technological advancements that are all being worked against us as black people and uh, and actually against the world population yeah. that are going to be that is that is actually going that, that uh, you're dealing with a concentration of power now so when we talk about these these black methods and we and when we talk about finding solutions to get us in a, in a position to where we are able to deal with self-determination we got to start promoting the essence of more than just social revolution, but technological right. revolution, yep. political revolution. Mm -hmm. So we got we got to move beyond just simply talking about the social revolution. We got to get into the technological aspects. There are powerful cats in, in terms of our people that are scientifically advanced and, and capable of matching anything Elon Musk can do, but don't have access to those the resources to put it on a scale that mm -hmm. we can use. So we have to start promoting the essence yeah. of black genius and, and, and coupling that element with where we need to go as a people. So I, I wanted I just want to throw that out there and get y'all to speak on that a little bit if you want. Well, family, I don't want to throw everything on the table because you know I don't want to give everything away to our open enemy that might be listening and whatnot. But what I will say is this. Uh one thing that I think is very important is that we get, we understand the highways that are in between the cities that we're in to where we just know how to navigate our way back and forth, man, all throughout. I was a, I was in the game. I'm gonna just say it like that. I was in the game. So at a young age, I was jet setting back and forth across the United States, down South <laughs> to West Coast, East Coast, Midwest, you know what I mean? Not really quite knowing where I was going, just knowing I was going to get there, you know what I mean? However, what it did, it gave me a good navigational sense of how to move around, man, and how if one city don't got something, the other city got it. See what I'm saying? If it ain't popping in one city, it's, it's, it's popping in another one. And I think 
you know, well, the white people didn't couldn't navigate this country. If you ever read about York and Lewis and Clark, York showed Lewis and Clark all around the Northwest Territories because they didn't know, they couldn't speak the languages and they didn't know where they was going. You know what okay. I mean? But this is something that we've lost as, I'm gonna say, I'm a more Morpheus, okay? One mm-hmm. thing more mean is navigator, to be able to navigate the trade routes of your land by water, by sea, etc. And we gotta, we gotta get a grasp of that to where we can start moving these fruits and vegetables from the South up to different places where there's food uh, uh, deserts, you know? We yeah, can yeah. do this. We can do this, yeah. man. We get some refrigerated trucks, man. We can roll out and make sure all of our people have these things available, man, because sometimes it's not that the food is not available, but they're going to give it to the best stuff to the white people and leave us with the scraps. I done seen it happen plenty of times, you know? So this is what I'm talking about when I say the 16 Black Meccas, finding out where our people's at, and making sure they have access to resources and high quality services, family. Where's Bond? Yeah, that's that's what I that's what I'm at. Not just talking about it. Well, I brought yeah. I, I brought up what I brought up simply because okay. kind of when we when we touched on uh, counterintelligence. Yes, I, sir. I often I often got to remind people that there are two elements of that program: is the counterintelligence and counter consciousness. The consciousness mm-hmm. goes into our suppressing our ability to be able to think on a, on a higher level. Again, right. because we keep getting tunnel vision and focusing in one direction as it applies to revolutionary science, warfare, and, 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 and advancement. And so, therefore, we have to come outside of that box. And the whole point of counterconsciousness has to do with limiting the scope of our awareness and, and, and the fronts that the battles are taking place. I'm not expecting us, nor should it even make sense for us to get into actual strategy here, but the point being, is what we can do and what we must do is make right. the people aware of the fact that we are have been limiting ourselves in terms of our conscious awareness of how we're being attacked and, and, and why we're being attacked and where we're being attacked. You see, so we, we show up talking about basically white supremacy, but we have to get into the essence of why, when you, especially when you talk about the epigenetic aspect, why it is on the course it's on and and again, remember, you cannot fight a target that you can't identify, which right. goes why you destroy our identity. Once you destroy our identity and we're stripped of an identity, then we're also stripped of our ability to be able to recognize the other identity, which is mm-hmm. the enemy, because it becomes one and the same. So therefore, mm-hmm. we attack ourselves because we are so much we are so much embedded in that personality that we cannot create a separation so that there can be an actual uh, uh, enemy to target. You see, so That's we, real, bro. it's, That's our, real. it's our position to bring these up. So the solutions I'm saying, and, and we have to, you know, be able to close the show on something to that degree, is to talk about the fact that and I, we and we got nine minutes, Walter. You've been going out, but we got nine minutes to the close of the show. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, so go ahead. so the point I'm getting at is we 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 want to open up. I listen audience uh, consciousness to the fact that I can't identify a web an enemy. I can't identify a target until mm. I can identify myself. And I can't identify mm. myself if I'm mm. operating through someone else's definition. Right. Operating through someone else's definition doesn't mean that you understand and overstand how they're applying that definition to themselves. You see, we got mm-hmm. to do more than just oh, than just understand what's going on, but we have to enter and open. I, mm-hmm. And I, I fashion that to tell people all the time that understanding is an example of that would be simply knowing how to drive a vehicle. You know, most people know how to drive a vehicle. Understanding would be in knowing how to repair that a vehicle. Overstanding would be in knowing how to put how to build one yourself. So when mm-hmm. we talk about that, our mm-hmm. our, 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 our our position as it applies to the things that you referenced, uh, the communication, the information, uh, I forgot the other one, the communication, the information, and transportation, mm-hmm. we, have to be at, we have to be at positions of overstanding. Every one of the trifactors that we bring up, whether we talk about physical, mental, and spiritual trifactor, or whether we talk about the modes that you just referenced, information, mm-hmm. transportation, and communication, another trifactor. If we are not able to identify and, mm-hmm. and, and deal with these from the uh, understanding, understanding, and overstanding perspective, then we are not going to be in a position to implement power. The bottom line to any 
to anything that we're able to that, that we need to be able to tackle is we have to utilize power. We have to have a form and a basis of power to be able to address it. So everything is going to orchestrate around power because when you talk about white supremacy, all we're talking about is a system of oh, no, no. prime mm-hmm. prime supremacy, which is a mm-hmm. system of power. Everything is about power. I can't sit with you as an equal, or you can't demand anything from me, or you can't take anything from me, or there can't be consequences to your actions unless I have power. The bottom line, if every move you make against me to try to weaken me as a person, if there is no consequence to, to, your, to you doing it, there is nothing to stop you from doing it. Yeah, so it our power base is going to be is going to be uh, is going to be entrenched in our ability to create consequences right. on all fronts. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to end it with that. Well, yeah. it's interesting you say that because today is the tenth tenth letter in the alphabet is justice, which is a penalty or a reward for one's ways and actions. And like I always say, if you don't know how to serve justice, you ain't gonna never get it. So. Put that on the table. And I like to say that we already received the penalty. It's time for us to receive the reward, man. Create the reward. And that would be these 16 black meccas flourishing, man, as they're supposed to. Everybody else making money off it. It's time for us to make some money off it. If you ever watch, it's a little joint on YouTube. It's called How to Sell to the Negro. And this is kind of where I kind of saw this network of cities. Because they were explaining to white people who used to be, well, probably still was racist, but this is how you can make some money off these Negroes. This is how you sell to them. This is the psychology. But they had these these cities. They were talking about the cities in which we, you know, have a, a, a high degree of um, hegemony as far as commerce, man. So everybody else making money off it. A lot of the um, um, so-called uh, immigrants that come to this country, they give them this map. And if you notice, you'll see them in all these cities getting money off of black people with a 7-Eleven, with a car company, whatever, man, predatorily, you know, preying upon our community, but they gonna do it because we ain't doing it. (laughs) We need to be doing it. We should have our network in place. And that's all I'm saying with the information, communication, transportation, this is the first step of us kind of connected and saying, hey man, we all live in the same house, but you trapped in your room, I'm trapped in my room. We need to connect all these rooms where we could access and control over the house. Cause we run in the house. But we, I, we compartmentalized, you know, to where I want to get to the kitchen. I can't get to the kitchen, man, because it's, it's blocked off. <laughs> <You> no, <know? laughs> nah, but really, though, y'all, you know, I really appreciate that, you know, y'all, y'all bringing me amongst, you know, in this um, august body, man, to build on these topics, man, because sometimes it's the space and the place and the face, right? The space... Yeah. The place, the face. Sometimes there's no space to do certain things, to where certain conversations cannot happen. But if there's a consistent place and space, and these black faces, they have these conversations, man. This is what keeps it in the air. We'll keep the conversation alive and the thought, you know, these thoughts in the air, man, and people thinking them. But if it's never expressed, that's the First Amendment, you know? You can never get it from from knowledge to born to reality. So I appreciate the space, family. Where does bump? Oh, I do, yeah. man. I mean, appreciate the substance that go into the conversation, the time y'all take. Don't ever stop, man. No, oh, please don't ever stop, man. The world need this, man. This like oxygen to the to the to the revolutionary mind. Oh, oh no, no doubt, no doubt. Really? Uh, we have three minutes. Anybody else got anything they want to put on the plate before we get ready to close it down? I appreciate you, uh, Brother Magnetic, for coming on and, and building on the subject matter. Matter of fact, I think you kind of you kind of inspired something in me that uh, I might feel the need to come back on this subject and kind of mm-hmm. kind of develop it and build on it as well. Uh, anybody okay. got anything to say before we get ready to close out? I definitely Brother want to. Uh, yeah, you know, you, one of the things you said on one of the in the eleven points is the misinformation, and mm-hmm. you said, when this misinformation takes you off, you know. On a on a tangent, you know, and it made me think about like this. What I heard about a, a sailor. If a sailor is what just one degree off from his destination, a hundred, uh, 10, 20 miles later, he's he's completely off course with just one degree. You know what I mean? So the misinformation is he just one degree of misinformation. 
the long run, it's gonna take you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And the misinformation is about it. When the misinformation sells, mm. you're, mm. you're, you're never gonna, you're always gonna be off on a, on a thing, you know what I mean? So the misinformation is real. And I also wanted to touch on that, on that tribalism and their, and their religion, because they mm. divide the elementary. Oh, I'm, I'm the, we're, we're the Martin Luther King Bulls, and, and y'all, the, the, the book, uh, 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 wizards over there, they've been doing this shit since forever. East side, west side, north side, but you know, man, I appreciate yeah. you. I appreciate you brothers having man. Um, it's always a blessing, man. For real. Let me say that one. And, and, and as long yeah. as you, we are achieving our degrees by our enemy, we're gonna always be off course. Remember that. If we define oh. our, we always gonna be off off course. So we there gonna you be, go. Come, on, Come on. on, on the on the wrong path. Period. Oh. <laughs> Way, way off. Oh, and wow, with that, with that, I'm gonna get ready to close out. Oh, okay. Uh, if you made it this far, oh, Nehemiah, go ahead, brother. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you some moment. You, you had something to say? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the mercy, brother, because I see you're about to turn off the lights and shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Put the chairs up and everything, brother's like, we gotta go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to highlight the. Uh, I won't say we didn't get into it, uh, but the micro nationalism, the four devils. And I want to add a part of that with the uh, robot, the residuals of or, uh, organizing uh, of black organizational trauma. Mm. Um, when we see, um, we must not look at it as though it's a random happenstance. When these okay. four devils, the four devils and the four in, uh, unclean spirits, the rusty, dusty, must. <laughs> you know, shout out, to, shout out to Brother Magnetic. He be lacing me up. But these, these characteristics, like he said, oh, I know my shit stinks up. Y'all shit stink. He put that, that this big shit. You know, these things are high sciences of white supremacy to allow us to stop uh, fraternizing with each other to stop our community engagement with each other is to make us look at each other as strangers is to make us have an individualism about yes, ourselves so don't we so we don't look at each other as a collective so we don't share that black collective conscious it's also uh it works against us because if we're striving for individual achievements to get browning points from white supremacy and we use that as a ladder so we can go up and we will use uh, the boot heels that we're, uh, the boots that we're supposed to pull ourselves up by, but we will use that to stomp on another brother or sister that's trying to come up the ladder. When we look at white supremacy, we see nepotism working highly effective for their benefit, but in our community, we don't use nepotism. We don't carve marks. And uh, although we do this subconsciously, uh, Francis Crest Wilson said that the black mind, we take everything in on the subconscious and then it comes out on a conscious level. So as we mm. see what white supremacy has put in us on just something real discreet where we don't realize what it's doing. But if we sit back and see how it plays out, it creates something of uh, a great, uh, just how y'all recently just said it. J just a couple wrong turns and you're way off course. So when our organizations, when it becomes competition, when it becomes division and factionalism, and it becomes more of a, 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 a throwing piss and, and throwing shit fest, mm -hmm. then now mm -hmm. we have that residual, the residuals of black organizational trauma. And this makes the faith in the black collectivity, it lowers it, it lowers the black, um, it just it lowers everything it creates a meltdown a mouth a yeah. complete malfunction of the organ uh, of our uh what we should say is the catalyst that kept our community flowing you know um we did we do we did all that when we do our research and we look how we were able to do it through organizing even in, even in the days of slavery how was there a underground railroad organizing Come on now, come on. Yep. And the organization, or, or, or the organizational process of it, just wasn't to get you to Mexico, or just wasn't to get you to a Canada, or to get you to a free state. It was to also put clothes on your back, give you a job, feed your family, 
give you a life worth living. It gave it's us, we was looking way. for all the 12 jewels from the beginning of time. So as there we see it now, organization is our strength. You know, yep. me by myself, I ain't shit. But if I stand with you and I stand with the next person, now we know a little something. We all, you know, now we could go ahead and, you know, as we say on the street, bust some jugs legally. You feel me? <laughs> all right, but yeah, I didn't want to drag it out. No deal. Thank y'all. All right, brothers, uh, the people watching, if y'all made it this far, then you have, should have no problem subscribing to the channel <laughs> and liking the video. And with that, we got to close out. Peace and power. Oh, Back power, refinement, family. Hey, Myrfa. Yes. So that's a word that translates to win them. Yeah. You're going to say, yeah. I'm going to grunt. Right? That's the, the gorilla tribe's grunt. Who? You just repeat who. So I say, Myrfa, you say, yeah. Yeah. I say, who? Who? Myrfa. Yeah. Who? Myrfa. Yeah. My brothers and sisters, we have to put a stop to this. And it will never be stopped until we stop it ourselves. They attacked the victim. And then the criminal who attacked the victim accuses the victim of attacking him. This is American justice. This is American democracy. And those of you who are familiar with it know that in America, democracy is hypocrisy. Now, if I'm wrong, put me in jail. But if you can't prove that if democracy is not hypocrisy, then don't put your hands on me.